Salam bangsa Malaysia dan salam sejahtera kepada semua rakan-rakan. Terima kasih kerana menyertai kami dan dalam uh, Sri Dialog Bangsa Malaysia yang bertajuk Hala Tuju Sektor Kesehatan Negara. Thank you everyone for joining us and we're really happy to have such an esteemed panelist today to discuss uh, our government's public health policies. Uh, dialog ini berhasrat berdiskusi uh, sejarah dan masa depan uh, sistem kesihatan awam negara. So um, tambahan pula, we would like to highlight some of the successes and failures of our current system. So the dialogue will be moderate, moderated by the lovely Dr. Munira uh, from Kase Hospice Foundation and uh, on to her. Okay, thank you very much, Harmit. Uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum dan salam bangsa Malaysia uh, buat para panelis kita uh, dan juga para pendengar. Um, jadi malam ni uh, kita akan membincangkan hal tuju sektor kesihatan Malaysia uh, secara santai ya, uh, di kalangan panelis pakar-pakar uh, kita. Uh, dan uh, kita akan juga dui bahasa, eh, quite casual between English dan bahasa Melayu uh, dan kita akan uh, mendalami apa uh, tentang kekuatan uh, atau kejayaan dasar-dasar kesihatan di Malaysia uh, mungkin kekurangan juga dan uh, kalaulah pakar-pakar uh, kita malam, malam ni adalah Menteri Kesihatan uh, jadi apa cadangan mereka untuk masa depan uh, dasar dari segi dasar polisi kesihatan untuk Malaysia Uh, jadi, when we uh, have this dialogue, uh, you know, Bangsa Malaysia, uh, we actually uh, feel that uh, we have many resources, you know, great resources within our community and great Malaysians who have rakyat centric ideas for the general health policy future in Malaysia. So that's what we want to discuss tonight. Dan kita mengharapkan juga perbincangan dari uh, audience kita uh, di samping pakar-pakar kita. Okay, uh, tanpa melengahkan masa, uh, uh, I will introduce our esteemed panelists for tonight uh, mengikut uh, di poster, ya, yeah, poster kita. So, uh, pertamanya kita ada Dr. Michael Jayakuma atau Dr. Kuma. Uh, he's a medical doctor and was the MP for Sungai Siput for two terms from 2008 to 2018. He's currently the chairperson of the PSM which he helped set up in 1996. He's a co-convener of the People's Health Forum, which was set up to lobby for a better healthcare system for Malaysians. So welcome, Dr. Kumar. Next, um, Dr. Chi Heng Leng, or Heng Leng, uh, nice to meet you tonight. Uh, so doc, uh, Dr. Chi Heng Leng works in the field of health and healthcare and was part of the group that founded the Citizens Health Initiative in 1998. She has previously held positions in University of Putra Malaysia, um, the Asia Research Institute and the Women's Development Research Center. Her publications include articles on health, healthcare and medical tourism in academic journals, a special issue in global social policy on medical travel and the edited book Healthcare in Malaysia, Dynamics of Provision, Financing and Access. Um, so that's our second speaker. Uh, our third speaker is not here tonight yet, uh, Dr. Murali. Uh, he, if he comes in soon, I will introduce him. I, I, we, we hope to have his presence here tonight. So next is Dr. Lim Chi Han or Chihan, is a founding member of Agora Society. He's a senior researcher at Third World Network. He holds a PhD in infection biology from Hanover Medical School, Germany, and an MSc in immunology and BSc in biotechnology from Imperial College, London. Um, health and socioeconomic policies are his concerns with particular focus on health financing and public health. Currently, he's a columnist for the Malaysian Insight, Oriental Daily, and Contemporary Review, also a regular commentator on health policy issues appearing on BFM and AIFM. He firmly believes in universal healthcare as an entitlement based not on the ability to pay, but the, on, basis, on the basis of need. And last but definitely not least is Professor Noor Aisha Taib, who um, pre is, has been a senior consultant breast surgeon, uh, head of UM Cancer Research Institute, vice president together against cancer and NGO representing cancer patients, uh, representing, sorry, cancer patients, healthcare providers and supporters. 
also a member of the City Executive Committee of the Greater Pataling City Cancer Challenge launched on 28th of June. And her area of focus is on improving quality and access to cancer care. So as you can see, we have very esteemed and very um, you know, expert panelists with us tonight. Uh, dan kita sangat mengharapkan idea-idea uh, dan perbincangan yang menarik dan uh, hebat uh, daripada panelis kita malam ni. Okey, uh, jadi uh, sebelum kita bermula uh, uh, dengan round pertama, uh, mungkin saya ingin menjemput uh, uh, para panelis uh, ataupun mungkin uh, Cihan dulu uh, untuk mungkin memberi sedikit pengenalan tentang uh, uh, ada sistem uh, macam mana kita nak pandang. Uh, how do we look when we are talking about health systems? What are the uh, uh, you know, what are the building blocks, what are the outcomes, maybe you can give us a bit of introduction so that as a kind of uh, leading into our discussion tonight. Good evening, everyone, um, audience online and uh, panelists and Dr. Munira as our moderator here. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, thanks to uh, the project uh, Bangsa Malaysia. Uh, today, I think this is some very um, serious but important topic. Um, and uh, due to pandemic is ever so, a lot of people pay attention to pol uh, health policy. Um, so um, so how do we look at um, health? We know that uh, we have a Ministry of Health, but there are other ministries also um, have something to do with health. Uh, for example, um, Ministry of Education or the higher, uh, higher education, also have uh, universities running healthcare. Um, they are also the Ministry of Defense. They also have the, the military hospital. And um, so um, health is like somebody defined is, um, is, a, is a kind of social determinants. A lot of uh, factors will affect the, the final outcome. Um, we want to have a healthy living. We want to have a safe environment. So um, there's a lot of things can go in and uh, affect uh, what we call, we say about uh, the quality of health. And um, from WHO, um, they have uh, on health, they have uh, six um, areas to look at. So it, we talked about the health system because if we want to have a good health policy that interconnecting with um, many other areas. So um, these six um, building blocks will be important. First, we have to look at um, the healthcare delivery. Then we have to look at the um, health workforce because we know that there will be people giving you the care and work behind the scene at the labs or doing the checkup on your food quality to ensure there's no contamination in your food. All this would be also part of the, the health workforce. Health and healthcare, are the, healthcare is a subset of the, the bigger health uh, uh, fear, sphere, okay? And then we need uh, information. So health information would be important, so, such as your medical records and um, other st statistics that got you uh, knowing much more about your health and the uh, health in general. And then um, we need to talk about medicines because um, when people get sick, they need treatment and medicines would be one of the major items for um, healthcare treatment. And um, there's a lot of issues about um, the access to this treatment because um, some for certain diseases, if without the access to certain medicines, so you don't have the treatment, then you're probably uh, running off some risk of um, getting more ill or possibly um, uh, have the risk of death uh, prematurely. And then um, more important is, talk to, is to talk about the health financing. Yeah, so um, everything um, from your hospital bills, uh, from your uh, vaccination, everything has need to have somebody to pay for. And we need to have um, hospital running, paying people salaries, um, and need to have um, people running regular services such as to do the food check, med medicine approval, all this. So um, financing is very important. And a lot of uh, countries uh, have to deal with a very expensive cost of uh, healthcare and health. So um, it's a very contentious issue. 
And lastly, if not, it's more importantly, is uh, the leadership and governance of um, yeah, the governance of uh, the policies. So we, mu we must acknowledge that a lot of things would affect health. So um, when we talk about, for example, the pandemic, the control of the disease, uh, so that needs a coordinated actions uh, among many ministries uh, to, to deal with the issues. So um, to me, uh, Malaysia, uh, we have in inherited the system from uh, our colonial master, British, um, since uh, independence. And a lot of things seems working because um, I think uh, we, we must uh, appreciate that we have a quite a robust, robust system. Um, and uh, this, the system is slowly evolving and built up up to the, um, the current uh, stage that we can see today. Uh, we have a two-tier uh, healthcare system where you can uh, have um, uh, your access to your uh, uh, healthcare treatment in the public sector, meaning MOH, uh, MOHE, and MOD. And, and also, we also have a choice if you want to um, go for uh, your private clinic or to private hospital because you just like certain specialists or certain environment or certain services. If you have money, you can afford, you are free to go to. But these two systems actually work on a very quite different um, principles. Uh, for the private, it's uh, very, uh, very clear. It's a fee for service because you have to make sure that you have money, uh, you can afford it, then they will accept you uh, for the treatment. But for, um, for our government or public system is uh, mainly on per capitation. If you, um, if you are a citizen of this country, you are entitled to certain rights. And you, you probably need, just need to pay a nominal sum, a charge, uh, for example, one ringgit for, for getting your, uh, to see your doctor, get a diagnosis, and even get your uh, medicine just under the $1 bill. If you need to get the referral, referral to a specialist, you need to pay only five ringgit. And this fee structure has been set since the uh, 80s. It has not uh, been changed since then. So um, our public healthcare system, which is mainly funded by our taxpayers' money, it's not government money, it's our, our own money. So, um, so in that sense, actually, this uh, provides quite a good basis uh, to protect people from the lower income so that they, they can be ensured to have access to healthcare and the services since the, uh, the, the birth of the children. You get a regular checkup, you get vaccination for free, and um, there's a lot of services provided by the government actually uh, towards the health outcome. So I would say um, we have this foundation built on since the very beginning, and we can see that uh, for the past uh, one and a half years under the pandemic. Although right now we are struggling to deal with the issues, but um, we, if, if not for the better foundation that we have, probably we have been crumbled much earlier, like India and other countries. So I guess I will uh, stop here at the moment. Yeah, I will pass on to the next uh, uh, speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chihan, for that uh, kind introduction to uh, our healthcare system in Malaysia, which helps us to, uh, to understand it from the building blocks of the WHO. So just to summarize, we focus on six building blocks, which is service delivery, number two, health workforce, three, health information systems, for access to essential medicines, five, financing, six, leadership and governance. And when we look at um, goals and outcomes. We look at improved health uh, responsiveness, social and fin financial risk protection, and also improved efficiency. So we'll try and uh, address according to um, these uh, kind of building blocks and outcomes as we go uh, through the discussion tonight. So thank you very much for that, Chihan. Um, so uh, welcome, Dr. Murali, uh, uh, with, uh, onto uh, the board. So I will just quickly introduce Dr. Murali. Um, is uh, currently and previously was a journalist with the New Straits Times. He's worked in various capacities with MOH and global organizations such as WHO. Um, he's currently managing director of National Cancer Malaysia, co-chairman of the NCD Alliance Malaysia, also a columnist in Free Malaysia Today, and also a book author, speaker, lecturer, researcher, and civil society activist. So welcome, Dr. Murali, uh, onto our panel tonight. Hi, Bruni. Right. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, please go ahead. 
Hi. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, okay. Uh, so we'll go on to uh, uh, some discussion now uh, after that kind introduction by Cihan. Uh, so uh, round pertama kita, kita akan membincangkan tentang kejayaan uh, dasar polisi kesihatan negara kita setakat ini. Uh, mungkin kita boleh bincang pre-pandemic uh, atau semasa pandemik, uh, uh, kita boleh bincangkan kejayaan dulu dari segi pendapat uh, panelis kita. So mungkin saya mulakan dengan Dr. Kumar dahulu. Dijemput Dr. Kumar. Uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, unmute please. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you Dr. Munira and hello to all the other panelists. Um, I think you know the you're talking of the um, the success of the Malaysian healthcare system. Actually, it's a very hybrid system. It was set up mainly as a public healthcare system based on the principle of healthcare is a need, and that society should provide decent healthcare to all its people. Then, along the way, maybe about 1980s onward, there has another another policy came in, which is that healthcare is a commodity which uh, people should buy on the market. So we have two conflicting policy frameworks so that determining healthcare. The people who believe that healthcare is a commodity to get foreign exchange and all that, and they go for you know, things like health tourism, which actually aggravates the brain drain and lessens the number of uh, people, uh, specialists in government sector. Whereas the people who believe in uh, that healthcare is a human right, and that the government should provide it at a very subsidized cost, uh, keep fighting for higher budgets and all that. I think we must really congratulate the, congratulate the MOH that they managed to maintain the capacity of the healthcare system up till now. Right now, I think the MOH, the government sector, looks after about 70% of inpatients and about 50-60% of outpatients. And to have maintained this despite the fact there's been a, a shift in policy uh, directions, I think it's quite good. And we got to uh, we got to appreciate the fact that the government has put aside 10% of the national budget every year to maintain the healthcare system. I mean, of course, people like me would like more to be spent and the health, the public healthcare system to be stronger. But we've got to appreciate the fact that it has been maintained. It's still a quite a formidable healthcare system. It forms a bedrock in our care of patients. And I think it's played a big role in combating, handling the COVID pandemic. And I think that those are the positive parts of it. Thanks, I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much on that, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, so uh, there's you know, lots to appreciate about our health system. And maybe those of us who have been abroad also appreciate this better as well when we compare and contrast our health system to other healthcare systems. Okay, uh, so kedua, saya jemput Dr. Chi Heng Lang atau Heng Lang uh, untuk berkongsi dengan kita. What is your opinion of the strengths of our health policies so far? Terima kasih, pengurusi. Uh... Saya minta minta kebenaran bercakap, bercakap dalam, dalam bahasa Inggeris ya. Uh, ya, yeah. so talking about the success of our healthcare system, I think the greatest success is that if you look in terms of the last 60 years, six decades since independence, our maternal mortality rate and our infant mortality rate really, really dropped. Okay, and this is because of we have been able to build up a very good network of uh, community health centers and clinics on the ground level, uh, primary care level, and in particular, the rural health service. Now, the rural health service is not from the British. I beg to differ with uh, Dr. Lim Chi Han. The, the rural health service was largely built up in the 60s and the 70s. The British left us with a very strong public administration, that is true, but not the rural health service and the, uh, and, and the, the, the clinics on the ground. So I think that is our one great achievement. And that, that is not just infrastructure, it is also staff. Because to, to staff all these uh, clinics, we, we had to do training, we had to set up the IMR, we had to do you know, we had to set up the medical school uh, and it is 
truly because of this very early strong foundation that our health system was definitely able to cope with COVID-19 at the very beginning. Unfortunately, other things got into the way and then we are now in a situation of crisis. Thank you, thank you, Heng Leng, for your input on that. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, many of uh, our esteemed panelists here tonight must have been, you know, many the founders of the great system that we do have today, actually. Uh, you know, you've put all in all the work and, you know, the younger, younger generation, where I consider myself the younger generation still, uh, you know, are, are reaping the benefits of the system that our seniors have, you know, have worked so hard to create. So uh, a lot of work has been put in, yeah, uh, to create the, the system that we have now. So thank you on that. Uh, Heng Leng. Um, okay, so uh, next maybe Dr. Murali, uh, boleh berkongsi dengan kita apa Dr. Murali, pendapat Dr. Murali tentang uh, kekuatan atau kejayaan dasar kesihatan uh, negara kita setakat ini. Dipersilakan. Salam sejahtera, selamat malam. Jadi, uh, of course yang uh, saya uh, mengambil beberapa pandangan pandang yang penting daripada bot uh, Dr. Lim Chi Han dan juga uh, Dr. Uh, J. Kuma, iaitu sebenarnya uh, ada beberapa uh, sektor yang sangat menarik tentang uh, aspek sistem kesihatan negara kita. Satu is, uh, kita ada a very very well widespread healthcare system tetapi and very very successful dalam tahun 70-an, 80-an untuk manage uh, acute disease yang still uh, apa yang kita dapat lihat walaupun dalam penekanan yang begitu tinggi during pandemik COVID ni still sistem kesihatan kita mampu bertahan kerana sebenarnya dia memang telah dibina untuk menghadapi wabak penyakit. It's a communicable disease oriented health system. Dan dia sangat-sangat berkesan dalam menangani masalah maternal dan child health. So untuk uh, uh, menangani isu kesihatan wanita, ibu-ibu dan kanak-kanak. Tetapi malangnya sistem kita tidak begitu efektif apabila tiba kepada saat di mana kita perlu menangani masalah non-communicable disease, penyakit-penyakit tidak berjangkit kerana uh, masalah maternal dan child health adalah masalah kesihatan yang kita boleh resolve secara intervensi yang pendek dan cost efektif. Maksudnya um, uh, tempoh uh, tempoh pregnancy seorang wanita hanya 9 bulan. So kita fokus untuk memberikan maternal care dalam 9 bulan je. So kita ada tempoh yang finit iaitu sepanjang tempoh uh, hamil seseorang wanita itu dan dalam tempoh itu kita ada beberapa intervensi yang kita perlu bagi, kosnya sangat clear dan kita boleh sediakan kemudahan tersebut. Tetapi bila umpamanya kita buka tentang uh, isu seperti kanser, satu penyakit yang tidak ada permulaannya, tidak ada uh, akhirnya, di tengah-tengah ada pelbagai uh, lekuk dan lembah dan gunung dan uh, sistem kesihatan kita tidak dapat menangani uh, apa ni masalah sebegini. So we really not geared untuk menghadapi uh, non-communicable disease. This is where we are really, really not doing well. And tetapi masalah ni akan terus berterusan kerana negara kita adalah negara yang semakin uh, tua. We are an aging society. Dan semakin banyak rakyat Malaysia yang mendapat penyakit yang tidak berjangkit. So both of it do not make for a rosy picture. So we have successfully set on the laurels of our past successes. Tetapi menuju ke depan, I, saya tak tahulah, boleh nampak titik, uh, satu titik uh, yang gelap lah, maybe, for our sistem kesihatan. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Murali. Uh, uh, terima kasih. Kita akan membincangkan tentang uh, uh, concern kita kejap lagi. Uh, tapi Dr. Murali telah highlight uh, bahawa sistem uh, our maternal health care, maternal uh, uh, in terms of uh, maternity health is is one of the best in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, having having been in the system in the UK, uh, memang actually kita tiktok very, you know, at, uh, affordable and, and really good uh, in terms of our maternal health care. So, uh, fantastic work that's been uh, put into that. Uh, terima kasih Dr. Murali. Uh, jadi uh, kemudian saya menjemput uh, Profesor Nur Aisyah Taib, uh, Profesor Aisyah untuk uh, berkongsi tentang uh, apa pendapat tentang ke kejayaan, kekuatan dasar kesihatan negara kita setakat ini. Okay, terima kasih Dr. Munira. Uh, memanglah saya ini bukan pakar polisi kesihatan sebab saya more dari segi pakar klinikal. 
Tetapi sebagai pakar klinikal, kita dapat lihat apakah um, efek polisi itu kepada uh, pekerja pihak apa dalam workforce mini, uh, kesihatan ya di Malaysia. So saya pun akan bercakap dalam pelbagai bahasa ya. Saya saya taklah sebegitu bagus seperti Dr Murali ya sebentar tadi. Sebab Dr Murali ni dia boleh berbincang dalam pelbagai bahasa ya. Kalau kita bercakap Tamil pun dia boleh ya. So memang Dr Murali ni very multilingual. Jadi saya nak tekankanlah sebenarnya polisi kita uh, dari segi kesihatan in terms of healthcare worker uh, workforce sebenarnya I would say the policy is there in terms of training. So kita sebenarnya di Malaysia ni kita ada kepakaran pelbagai. So kita ada kepakaran uh, cancer, kita ada sistem untuk uh, train doktor-doktor uh, untuk menjadi pakar ya. Yeah? tetapi kita juga tahu sebenarnya tidak tidak cukup sebenarnya. So kita tahu kan ada masalah besar dalam health system uh, workforce kita di Malaysia. Uh, but dari segi policy, saya rasa dari segi training kita dah adalah cara-cara uh, di mana um, kita boleh uh, men-train pakar-pakar kita sendiri. Maksudnya kita tidak bergantung sepenuhnya kepada um, training dari luar negara. Seperti I think kalau uh, sebenarnya Dr. Kumar ni sebenarnya physician semasa saya house officer di Ipoh Hospital dahulu ya. So mungkin uh, Dr. Kumar eh, pada masa-masa dahulu uh, setiap pakar tu sebenarnya memerlukan kepakaran dari luar negara. Dia perlu ke luar negara untuk mengambil peperiksaan. Tetapi di Malaysia sekarang kita bo uh, boleh menghasilkan pakar-pakar kita sendiri. Akan tetapi ada banyak masalah dari segi uh, planning dan um, forward planning. Maksudnya kita dapati pada masa sekarang ni kita tak cukup pakar-pakar dan kebanyakan pakar ini berada di uh, private sector. So saya bekerja dalam uh, uh, cancer, eh, dalam uh, cancer work. Jadi keram, uh, kalau kita tengok ya eh, onkologis di negara kita, there is 114 onkologis for the whole of Malaysia ya. Yeah. Tetapi 72 atau 63% of them are in private practice. Ah uh, dan lebih getir kita kita lihat uh, untuk pakar-pakar uh, bedah yang sub kepakaran. Maksudnya dia bukan pakar saja, dia sub kepakaran yang boleh membuatkan efek pada uh, rawatan kanser tu seperti uh, apa GI surgeon kan mereka akan operate bahagian esophagus, tiup makanan yang atas ni dengan perut mereka ni sangat kurang. Kita I think about 70% of them. I think they are maybe if I'm not mistaken I don't have the numbers here but I think maybe they are less than uh, maybe about 20 to 30 of them for the whole country and about 78% of them are in private practice. So this is like really getir lah, you know. So if you want to have a good outcomes, you need really good surgeons for this very specialized type of cancers. So macam uh, Dr. Murad kata yang titik hitam tu memang kita nampak lah. Tetapi mungkin ada cara-cara lain eh, sebab kita mungkin tidak menggunakan kepakaran di di private practice tu untuk digunakan untuk kanser, merawat kanser untuk uh, akses kepada uh, masyarakat yang tidak berkemampuan sekarang ni. So there have to be some innovative uh, financing of the treatments of this patient sebab servisnya insya Allah ada. Kita ada almost enhanced care, cancer care in Malaysia and we have the most basic. So how do we get this to be more equitable for the society? So itu sajalah dari saya. Terima kasih Dr. Minira. Terima kasih Profesor Aisyah. Cancer ni memang sebenarnya semua pun dekat dengan hati saya sebab saya train as family physician atau GP specialist dekat UK tapi sekarang saya kerja di Kasih Hospice Foundation so saya memang menjaga pesakit kanser tahap akhir lah uh, di bawah hospice so it's very uh, close area to me as well but apa Profesor Prof Aisyah uh, highlight kan ialah the fact yang kita actually we train our own doctors sekarang ni, our own pakar sekarang ni which is a long way we've come a long way from you know like you said many years ago kita perlu hantar semua orang keluar negara untuk jadi pakar. Sekarang ni kita mampu train pakar di kita sendiri tetapi uh, kita tahu isu uh, doktor kontrak, isu ke tak cukup kepada kepa dan isu uh, brain drain kan. Uh, Okey uh, sebelum saya pergi lebih lanjut sebab kita akan membincangkan lagi kejap lagi uh, saya jemput uh, Cihan semula untuk uh, share your thoughts about uh, the strengths of our current health system. Oh okay. Uh yeah, just now I, I think I talked a little bit about the strength already. Uh, and the one thing is 
I, I would say it's wonderful because the government often emphasize of the universal health care cover, health coverage. And um, they mean um, the services can penetrate through different layers of a society. If you are a citizen um, and uh, the, the services will be set up in a way that have like, some kind of coverage in, in terms of physical distance, there's a household income and basic amenity survey uh, done every two years. Um, it's found that right now in Malaysia, um, 93% of the population uh, living within five k kilometer radius uh, to the nearest public health centers. So by right, um, everyone should be at least uh, get the access to healthcare. And um, of course, the, the sound already said that there are a lot of other uh, health services provided by the government. So um, uh, in terms of the vaccination, uh, the immunization rate is close to 100% for all the um, uh, the child uh, children's uh, under the, the uh, national immunization program and this has bring to tremendous uh, effect to reduce the uh, mortality rate for the um, the children five under five years old and things so um, so in terms of a uh, control of uh, um, um, communicable diseases or infection diseases we have a, have a very good uh, foundation um, due to those uh, e uh, evolution. I mean, I, I, I just now, like I say, uh, it's, we, of course, we uh, inherit something from the British, but we also develop on our own. Um, and I, I think um, this uh, would be my sharing on the strength. But I think I want to focus now on the, the, the weakness because I, we have seen the crack uh, of our system. Um, I, I will only um, put out one point. I think that is the major part is that the rising uh, demand for our public health care services is not met by the uh, resources provided by the government. Um, this is uh, quite um, um, obvious because um, even though we have a two-tier system, even though um, the private sector seems thriving, but um, a lot of our population are generally not so, um, um, how to say, wealthy or uh, uh, can afford enough of um, public uh, private health care system. So um, a lot of, of people, especially during the economic downturn and um, the crisis or, or economic problems, we will turn back to uh, public health. And uh, if you look at the, um, um, the, the record of um, outpatient numbers, uh, uh, admission numbers, you can see the demand actually rising every year. That's a lot. Uh, for the 10 years from 2009 to 2019, um, for outpatient admission, uh, you can see 15% of changes in terms of a rising number. And for the public health facilities, for example, the uh, Clinic Kasihatan, you've seen 42% more um, attendance uh, turn up in the uh, Clinic Kasihatan Clinic, they saw this. This has created actually a tremendous pressure for our MOH um, um, uh, uh, health workforce to deal with, especially when our um, training and our um, uh, workforce number are not increasing um, accordingly to meet the, the challenge of this rising demand. So you will see that uh, one uh, uh, physician or practitioner right now, compared to 10 years ago, they probably have to do double the work. Uh, and we have a limit uh, thing for the healthcare workers to deal with the situation. So um, it's not only not matched up in terms of uh, the numbers. I think the, the finance probably is the is one of the major issue because um, um, we have um, serious brain drain. Uh, I think it's very well uh, documented just now also uh, raised by Professor uh, uh, Aisha already that uh, we have a more experienced uh, specialists actually in the private sector while we need a lot of experienced uh, um, specialists ourselves in the public sector to train the new 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 young uh, talents. Yeah. Um, so um, although uh, I think I think the, the issue is that uh, we have not invested uh, enough. If you just look at the statistic, I think the stagnant growth of the healthcare facilities also is a is a trouble because um, we have seen more and more um, demand for this healthcare in the uh, hospital in terms of beds. But uh, we, we, we find the numbers is stagnant if you um, normalize to per 
100,000 population. Compared to 15 years ago, we have uh, four, uh, two, in 2005, we have uh, 145 uh, beds per 100,000 population. Two years ago, we also have the same number, but you have seen the, the numbers of um, demands for this bed, for, uh, for all the services have, have doubled up or tripled up for the past uh, 15 years. And then um, one very critical point about uh, our COVID-19 pandemic uh, response is that before the pandemic, we already seen quite a high uh, bed occupancy rate in uh, most of our MOH state hospital. Just two years, uh, in 2019, before the pandemic, for all the state health uh, uh, hospital, they are above, uh, they are 70% of um, uh, BOR, I mean, a bed occupancy rate and above at all times. So it's rather full capacity. Already. So that's why we have seen the crisis right now because uh, we are just running out of bed because uh, you have to take care of other non-COVID patients as well. So I think this uh, creates some kind of tension within our system. So I would say that um, the government, although they uh, allocate about 10% of uh, health, uh, the budget for MOH every year, but it's not enough. Clearly, um, that the government has to prioritize uh, among their policies, which is more important. I think for the uh, current situation under the, the COVID pandemic, people can finally see how important is our system, uh, how important is our readiness to think about future, plan for the future, plan according to the, the numbers because we can see the consistent uh, demand and how can we help uh, the, the health system to cope with all this rising demand. I'll stop here. Okay, thanks a lot, Chihan, for uh, for kindly just moving on to the, our second round, uh, which is talking about the weakness or what we perceive as, a, as the current weakness or points for improvement for our current health system. So this time I'll go uh, the other way around, yeah? So back, back to uh, Prof Aisha, uh, uh, what what are your thoughts? Apakah sebenarnya titik-titik kelemahan dalam sistem kesihatan negara kita setakat ini? Mungkin mungkin lebih diserlahkan dengan keadaan pandemik, mungkin berkaitan dengan pandemik ataupun secara secara general. Uh, dipersilakan Prof Aisha. Okay, thank you Dr Munira. Um, sebenarnya uh, kita semua komplain kan We are complaining and complaining and complaining at this moment um, But the, the health system is right now is under tremendous stress So we already see again ICU beds taken up How many? More than 100% Some places is 110% Some places 120% Yeah, even as we speak right now I think even in my hospital More and more hospitals are converted into acute uh, uh, COVID wards, you know so we are actually facing a massive um, onslaught and unfortunately we are not prepared because we have not been uh, communicating very well between the different sectors. So, you know, uh, in the past, kita punya kebanyakan daripada activity health, kita is in silos. So I thought whether it's good or bad because if you think about it, a lot of the advanced care may have started in the private sector, you know because of market demands themselves. So, so the, the private sector, I don't think is the evil, okay? Neither is Ministry of Health, but somehow we fail to come together and work as a team for the country. So I think that was, I think something that could have taken place maybe even as uh, back as 30 years ago, where we start to plan um, having, as what Dr. Kumar mentioned just now, you know, looking at hospitals as commodities. I think a lot of places have done well, a lot of other countries have done well, uh, having JCI, um, you know, hospitals in their countries, and yet having very strong public hospitals at the side of that, sharing the same workforce to work across these hospitals, you know. So I think I'm not sure what we can do in the short term, but definitely in the long term, we have to... There's a lot of uh, reform is not a nice word to use now because it sounds very political. But really, I think there need to be a lot of thought put in how the health systems can be changed in a way to involve all the sectors in a fluid, seamless manner. So, you know, I think if you just put all the services that we have in the country, private and public, I think we will have a very good health system. We have to think how to finance those services. I think, I think that is something that might have to come from experts, not me, 
but you know people who really know about uh, financing solving solutions like this um but in the short term i think we have to work together you know? so i think right now as we speak people from the different sectors ministry of health uh, academic hospitals private hospitals they're trying to make sure they can keep up with the icu beds but i think we are really falling through the cracks now so i think the rest of malaysia should pray hard and do the public health thing right now the right thing to do is to make sure you keep your social distancing wear the mask wash your hands stay at home if you can because uh, if you don't uh, you know do that the numbers are just going through the roof right now so and and at this point maybe we're going to be like india you know no oxygen and all that so i think we really 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 need to tell our public to strap down and ensure they they know this but i don't think many people know you know about even the public health measures i you know i um have walked around the hospital today and yet i still see people talking without their masks people uh, taking off their masks in the lifts you know and sharing food in a in a pantry without the mask you know so these are really important things that we have to say now this is what needs to be done now but in the long term definitely there has to be a lot of conversations and i think we need politicians who can actually talk about policy and change those policies um at that level and we need a strong um leadership really i think i think we are all looking to the, the to the government actually for leadership to ensure that all the sectors can work together you know okay so i'm going to stop here um <laughs> yeah thank you Munira. thank you professor uh, for for that insight um uh, bearing in mind this round uh, we we are trying to focus on the on the weaknesses we will be going at a third round okay for for oh, the really? position okay. if you are not okay don't, don't worry this is all really good input but i'm going to be inviting you again for the third round which is if you are menteri what will you do yes, so, so bear in mind don't worry you can have some more thoughts after this i'm sure you've got a lot to share uh, but uh, but but thank you for that uh, professor so basically what you highlighted was that we are working in silos yeah our health health system is great and and you know uh, again just sharing a bit of experience when i was in the uk they don't have a, a private healthcare system which is affordable to many and therefore you just have to wait in line you know you, you, you want to see a, a gp you want to see a gp you have to wait two weeks dah sempat baik dah sebelum you know uh, <laughs> sakit dah sempat baik including a doctor juga tunggulah dua minggu nak jumpa gp so I, what you are trying to say is 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 great in the sense that we do have a great private healthcare system we have a great government healthcare system as well and, and you know we have university hospitals which are actually a, a great addition to that but working in silos and, and during this pandemic it stretched and seen the cracks that you know if we don't work together we we, we can actually overcome this if the this we, we have to like you said work together you know make it more le, le, more seem uh, more seamless less seamless uh, basically um not working in silo lah yeah so so great points there uh, uh prof aisha all right so um i would like to uh, invite dr murali uh, semula uh, this time kita nak membincangkan tentang titik-titik uh, kelemahan eh dalam sistem kesihatan negara kita uh, dijemput uh, dr murali okay uh, terima kasih doktor so sebenarnya uh, uh, this the macam ironi sikitlah sebab uh, kita memandang tinggi the beverage system of the nhs tapi sekarang nhs punya system pun makin collapse oleh kerana itulah you can start to see the rise of private health insurance dekat uh, the UK orang yang boleh uh, membeli insurance dia membeli yang the bupa scheme kemudian so they they boleh pergi menjumpa private specialist uh, boleh uh, apa ni uh, get special facilities and you see more and more private hospitals start creeping up in the UK as well so walaupun NHS is a, such a good system and uh, and i'm a very firm believer in the beverage model tapi you can see even that the dia tak boleh tahan the tekanan ekonomi uh, dunia hari ni that thing so is is starting to crack so pun juga i think uh, and and i think dr jekuma pun selalu saya selalu mendengar beliau menceritakan hal ni dalam sistem kesihatan kita sebenarnya tak cukup duit kita tak pernah ada uh, bajet yang mencukupi untuk kita membina dan menyelenggara dan memberi uh, apa ni, uh, kemudahan yang kita perlu berikan pada kualiti yang optimum di dalam sektor awam. Benda ni uh, is is very uh, obvious for everyone to see. 
malangnya lah this is the story so uh, kita ada masalah pesakit yang menunggu untuk sekian lama kita ada pesakit jantung yang terpaksa menunggu berbulan-bulan untuk ke hospital sedang kerana sekarang uh, institut jantung negara bukan lagi uh, institut di bawah uh, sistem uh, kesihatan awam umpamanya institut kanser negara adalah satu institut yang mempunyai kurang sangat pakar onkologi yang dapat menampung keperluan semua pesakit onkologi di sektor awam misalnya so the, the list goes on and on so salah satu kelemahan yang again hari ini saya terpaksa go back to a lot to Dr. Lim and, and Dr. J. Kumar apa yang mereka tengah kata-kata dan of course Dr. Heng, uh, Cik Heng Leng pun sekali which is um, oleh kerana kita develop satu uh, private healthcare system dan private healthcare system ni continue to drain your best resources semua uh, pakar yang kita ada saya uh, apa ni saya selalu berkata saya kerja dalam NGO tapi berapa orang boleh uh, effort to work in an NGO you you see my point dia orang pun ada nak hantar anak juga belajar dia orang pun nak uh, ada juga nak beli kereta so susah untuk mereka uh, semata-mata everybody berfikir secara idealis you see so um, apabila ada tarikan untuk mereka ke hospital swasta uh, banyak daripada doktor-doktor kita sama ada terpaksa kerana wang atau ataupun terpaksa kerana tekanan tidak dapat naik pangkat dan sebagainya mereka bergerak ke sektor swasta tetapi di sektor swasta dia continue you are draining your best minds uh, and ki, bila kita kita tak boleh gunakan mereka balik untuk melatih uh, minda-minda kita our young, bright youngest minds uh, it, we, we, we go nowhere so our brightest youngest minds yang naik-naik pun semua lari ke UK sebab nak buat fellowship and consultant training dekat UK tak balik-balik kalau tidak pergi Australia tak balik-balik juga so it's it's a it's a sad sad story so uh, our biggest weakness in the system if you ask me is only one the fact that our private healthcare system dengan public healthcare system tidak ada jambatan yang menyambungi di antara mereka sehingga kita boleh menyambungkan kedua-dua sektor ini uh, kita susah untuk memperbaiki apa ni retakan yang yang saya fikir paling mendalam dalam our health system Terima kasih Dr. Murali, uh, pendapat yang sangat menarik dan sekali lagi menekankan isu uh, you know, working in silo between the the, the 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 government healthcare system and the private and how we can bridge this. Uh, Dr. Murali, minta maaf saya kalau saya salah uh, apa uh, give you an impression just now. Saya bukan mem- membesarkan sistem NHS, cuma saya menjadikan bandingan dan sebenarnya saya berada di situ juga ketika the NHS was cracking too. So I could see and compare and contrasting, you know, the strengths of our system. You know, if you want to see a GP, you can see, you can shop, you know, which GP you want to see, which private hospital, that's great. I, we, we don't have that, uh, they don't have that uh, uh, opportunity or uh, over there. But again, the pandemic stretch, that system showed the cracks, but they are now recovering from the pandemic and how come we are going uh, backwards a bit yeah so 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 uh, sorry kalau salah faham tadi oh, no 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 doctor no, not at all <laughs> saya sebenarnya kena mengaku saya anak didikkan daripada the school of beverage saya budak health policy lsc so memang <laughs> anak beverage lah we are okay. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Dr. Murali. Okay, uh, Dr. Chi Heng Leng. Heng Leng, would you like to share with us what your thoughts are on, on the weaknesses of, of our current system? Thank you. Uh, I think the previous speakers have already uh, mentioned a lot. Uh, I'd like to reinforce there's not sufficient, insufficient resources put in. For example, our our government health, health budget is only about 2% of GDP all these years never increase beyond that and yet this is way way below the uh, what uh, other government health budgets uh, put in especially the developed countries you know um, and if you look at uh, who recommendation is five percent gdp so we have to get up from two percent to five percent gdp and we need this money we need this money Number one, there are two big problems. One is, as you say, brain drain from the private, uh, from the public sector, which is a whole topic by itself, which I will talk about later. I, if I have time, I'll talk about later. And the other problem is the primary health care. Our primary health care has not kept up with the times, with our changing disease patterns, 
it has not kept up with our population and our demographic transition. Okay, so you need to upgrade primary health care. How to do this? Two ways, two sectors, two prong. One prong private sector, one prong public sector. Okay, public sector, you need to upgrade all your facilities. You need to recruit staff. You need to train staff and properly uh, staff all these clinics that we have at the ground level. And they have to be upgraded to, the, to comprehensive clinics with medical doctors, family doctors uh, serving there. Number two, there's no continuity of care. Okay, we need to reorganize for continuity of care, which is important for non-communicable diseases, NCDs, right? And thirdly, and most important of all, is health promotion. Our health pro promotion is like almost non-existent, okay? Uh, we need to beef up health promotion because if you look at NCD, okay, obesity, overweight, all this uh, hypertension, diabetes, um, heart attacks, all this stem from a problem of nutrition, right? And also you have, besides all that, do you know that we still have a problem of stunting of children under five years of age? So we are not just seeing NCDs at the top level, at, at, at the this extreme level. At the other extreme, we are also seeing undernutrition of children, which if you look at the NHMS, the National Health and Mobility Survey data, we have increased. We should be decreasing. It should be decreasing. How come stunting of children has increased? There's something wrong there, okay? So you need this community level health promotion. Okay, so this is for the public sector. For the private sector, okay, if you look at MOH clinics, uh, we have 2,885 2, MOH clinics now, close to 3,000. But you know, we have about 7,988 private clinics, GPs, and our urbanization has occurred so rapidly in the last 60 years from a rural society where have become an urban society. So the GPs are the ones who can reach out to this urban society because this is where they are, okay? So I think that we need to strengthen the GP sector as a primary care sector and connect it, connect it to the, to the uh, government sector, the public health sector. How can we do this? Actually, we have already started. Perpeka B40 is a very good program but it is not sufficient. It is so poorly funded, okay? You just compare it with my salam. And that is my grouse about the Pakatan Harapan government all along. So much money in my salam, which is total distraction, okay? And so little money in Pekka uh, B40, okay? B, Pekka for B40 is a very good start. It provides health screening on L, for NCD for uh, uh, B40 people, okay? Expand this, expand the coverage from the current screening for NCDs to include follow-up and overall continuous care. Pay the GPs adequately, please. Don't stinge, okay? Pay by a capitation system, which will prevent overtreatment, which will incentivize the preventive approach and will also promote continuity of care, okay? So by doing this, we can, you can see, you know, uh, uh, during COVID, uh, vaccination, vaccination, our, our government sector is so poorly connected to the GPs. So many GPs are still waiting to be called, okay? If you have a system where the GPs are connected, okay, and, and, and I'm proposing a contracting system by capitation to connect the GP system to the government system, okay? And this will give uh, for the patients, number one, it will connect the coordination and the between GPs and uh, private sector and public sector. Number two, uh, a patient can be followed by the same doctor for the continuity of care, free at the point of, uh, free of, free of 
charge at the point of use. That is very important to prevent uh, so that people are not, uh, you know, are not this disincentivized to use the, the, the health service. So it must be free at the point of use. And, um, and I think that this will do a long way to uh, overcome or at least to meet the problem of the NCDs. Because the problem of NCDs, first of all, is a problem of prevention. Second of all, is a problem of uh, detection at the early stage. Because we if you look at the, NH uh, uh, the, the data again, you can see that a lot of the NCDs, uh, a lot of people at the, at the communities, they don't know they have the NCDs until they do the health screening. Okay, this means that a lot of them are being seen only when they reach a very late stage, very serious stage, they go to the hospital and that's very expensive to treat. Okay, so they have to have early detection, which means you have to have all these uh, primary care level uh, uh, service. And I'm suggesting we use our GPs, uh, GPs and connect it to the, uh, to the public sector. Thank you so much, Heng Leng. Uh, I mean, I guess it's, it's quite hard, isn't it, to talk about weaknesses and not wanting to, uh, what do you call it, to discuss the solutions to it. But thank you. Uh, you've, you've kind of gone into our, th again, third round, but that's really great because, uh, Heng Leng, you've highlighted something slightly different there from maybe the rest of the speakers, which is a system kesihatan uh, prima kita, atau, uh, primary care system kita, uh, di mana, you know, system KK kita, which is on the government side, and also the private clinics, the private GPs, which are, again, issue dia they are connected uh, and me being a primary care physician at ground level i've been on both those sides you know it's just it's frustrating why because in kk when you work in kk you want to do your best you are seeing the the core the crux of the ncds but you have no time you're seeing like 100 patients in the morning you literally have like one minute per patient you know two minutes per patient how are you going to talk about diabetes hypertension you want to educate them is it's exhausting you just give up you know because you have to get through another 100 patients in the afternoon it is severely frustrating and, and not to say that they don't want the resources but like you said and everybody's highlighting there's not enough money tak cukup resource yang sebenarnya duit yang kita perlukan uh, nampaknya uh, Heng Leng uh, ada sebut kita memerlukan 150% lebih uh, duit masuk ke dalam uh, system kesihatan kita uh, and, and on the private GP side I've been there also tried that also it's frustrating because you are just seeing minor illnesses I want to see the NCDs in private you know uh, but and then it's uh, you know you have to because they are acting as a business, they have to think about profit, how to survive, and therefore, yeah, completely disconnected, and, and therefore lots of room for improvement there. I definitely agree with you there. Okay, so anyway, uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, how about you? Uh, what is your perception of the current weakness of um, our health, current healthcare system? And you may want to straight away go into the third round as to, if you were a minister, what would you like to change about the current, uh, our healthcare system? Okay, Dr. Munira. Um, don't tell the minister in a short time, but um, okay. Um, you know, if you look at the, uh, the the problems of the healthcare system, I think uh, the other four panelists have already talked about it. Question of lack of resources, uh, we have uh, loss of specialists and uh, lack of facilities in the government healthcare system, uh, and the fact that we are divided, private and, and public. But I think we need to see uh, that this is actually not really only a problem of the healthcare system itself. It's actually a systemic problem in that um, not only in Malaysia, you know, but in many countries all over the world, there's been a drop in government revenue as compared to GDP. Not only here, but even European countries and other developing countries. Like you say in Malaysia, for example, uh, our corporate tax was 40% of profits in 1980s. But from 88 onwards, it began coming down. And now it's only about 24% uh, right now. Corporate tax is 24% of profits. And um, the government actually wants to bring it down further because uh, Singapore is at 18%. I think Thailand is at 19%. So there is a competition among com countries to bring down corporate tax so we are business friendly and so we get investment. So this is a problem. This is a problem because it's affecting people all over the world, you know, not only Malaysia. And if we talk of lack of resources, okay, I mean, I agree with uh, Heng Leng that we need to put more money into healthcare, but then where do you take it from? Do you take it from education? Do you take it from welfare? Do you take it for transport? 
you take it from you know green projects. So there is a problem, you know, if you if you a government, if you're the minister of health, you know, it's not that easy. You know, see, like Dr. Zul when he first became minister of health yeah, in 2018, he said he's going to increase the health budget, but he gave up that very fast, you know, because the reality is the budget is limited, and I think the other ministries will see already getting 10 percent, and that's a, a pretty big cut of it. How can you ask for more? So that is the reality. So the reality goes back to that systemic problem where we are unable to tax MNCs, for example. You know, that the existing uh, financial system allows big companies to transfer out profits by using prices. You know, a big company here, when they want to say, take away profits from Malaysia, they will price their inputs the, the stuff they're importing from other countries, more expensive. And they price the, 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 the goods they're selling cheaper. So it's called transfer pricing. So the, so the profits are transferred to a jurisdiction where there is much lower uh, taxation, uh, maybe even no taxation, tax havens. So, and all that is halal, you know, it's allowed because we have got this, all these free trade agreements and liberalized financial system. It is not seen as wrong. So these are the kinds of things that we have to look, look at in Malaysia and also in other parts of the world, if you want to say, we want to use a larger amount of the surplus, of the economic surplus, to go towards healthcare, to give decent healthcare to our population, which means it can't go into the pockets of multinationals. It can't go to the pockets of the top 0.1%. They've got to give up a bit of it. And but that takes a, 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 a systemic uh, kind of thing because, if only we do it, we will lose investment. We will, we will face this transfer pricing and all that. So, because the global system now is international, you know, it's a global system. So we just can't simply just raise our taxes unilaterally. We'll have to think about how about the whole, you know, how do you keep, how do you, how do you prevent capital flight? So I think this is, Lisa, when you're talking about healthcare and improving the healthcare system, we cannot remain in the healthcare silo. We've got to see the whole question of financing, the whole question of how the wealth of society is being distributed, the whole question of how come we can't get our hands, how we, the government, can't get the hands on this surplus and use it for our people. Uh, we've got to be scared about capital flights. So what do you have to do internationally within ASEAN, within the group of 77? What do we do to change the laws? So I think it's important to recognize these things. You know, I mean, as doctors, you know, we know that the most important thing in handling clinical situations is the diagnosis. You don't know what the hell is going wrong. Similarly here, you know, what is the problem here? I think the problem here is the liberalized financial system that allows the top 0.1% of individuals and the multinational companies to take the surplus that they produce in Malaysia out. And we can't, and we cannot uh, tax them, we are scared to tax them too much because we think you will lose out. We tax them unilaterally, we think you lose out. But that is the problem. If that is the diagnosis, then what's the solution? So the solution is not just within the healthcare system. The solution is got to be something which is systemic. We'll talk within ASEAN, we've got to talk within the UN, we're going to talk within UNCTAD, and we've got to talk about uh, closing tax havens, for example. You know, this recent thing in the West where they're talking about a 15% basal tax on corporations brought in by Biden. I think that's a good idea. But in fact, 50% is paid where the money is created and not paid in the US or in Europe. If they make the money here, they can't take it back there and pay. They should pay us here, isn't it? So these are the kind of things that you've got to get involved in. So I think health activists can't just remain in our health silo because the issue is, uh, how is the wealth of society going to be used for the benefit of everyone, including our patients? And then we've got to talk about those kinds of larger issues, though it's not really what we are trained for. It's not really our expertise, it, but it really affects the quality of the healthcare that we can give our people. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, uh, uh, for that input. Now, uh, as we kind of uh, are entering our third round, uh, mungkin saya nak kongsikan, uh, kita, third round ni kita nak semua panelis kita bayangkan anda adalah Menteri Kesihatan. Jadi, apa yang uh, anda akan buat sebagai Menteri untuk improve, membetulkan improve 
uh, keadaan atau dasar polisi kesihatan sedia ada. Uh, tapi sebelum itu, mungkin saya uh, juga akan berkongsi tentang soalan-soalan yang uh, kita punya audience telah uh, berkongsi dengan kita. So we've had some uh, quite uh, you know significant questions from the audience and I'm hoping some of these questions may be answered in your solutions or in your ideas if you were you know in a position of authority to be able to um, remedy and improve our current health system. Okay? So uh, let's go with uh, some of the questions Number one, what is one simple thing the government can do to alleviate the current stre stress on public sector hospitals? Some of this has been mentioned. Um, how can Malaysian public health care strive to be more inclusive of diversity, especially in terms of body size, gender diversity and socio-economic differences? Um, somebody has asked about health insurance. So issue that with the health insurance in our country is that people are taking advantage of that system. Yeah, uh, the, the private health care are charging you know, beyond the actual price because they know they can capitalize on that. But then that drains, you know, the person who's paying the health insurance does, does not mean it, there's, a, there's a cap to it. So what can we do about this, uh, you know, exultant or misused health insurance system? Uh, number four, what about bureaucratic hurdles and decision making? So walaupun cadangan-cadangan uh, yang di, ataupun masalah-masalah yang kita tengok tadi, yang kita dengari, ada bukan uh, uh, ke, apa ni kaki tangan kesihatan kita bukan tak nak uh, solusi tu tetapi banyak sangat burokrasi uh, nak buat ni tak boleh nak buat tu tak boleh nak buat ni tak boleh in the end ataupun tak cukup duit so uh, how can we cut this bureaucratic hurdles and decision making to align you know what we want together actually okay number five um, migration of specialist doctors to private sectors uh, this is what we have mentioned so what is the remedial solution some of it has been mentioned. Again, you may want to um, uh, uh, touch on this again. Overcrowded hospitals. Uh, why are we not building new hospitals? There's a question on that. And about health tourism, uh, new private hospitals, which causes the brain drain. So we talked about brain drain as well. So lots of uh, issues here that you have mentioned also before. Tetapi macam mana kita nak uh, mencari penyelesaian kepada masalah masalah ini, uh, masalah yang dihadapi ini. Um, this is one thing. Uh, private hospitals, how they can help in the pandemic. And I think. Um, you know, uh, this is one current concern or urgent concern. How can we get the private health sector to come on board and help the really stretched government hospitals? So maybe uh, uh, one or a few of you would like to address that issue. Um, issue remuneration, remuneration dan perks menjadi hindrance kepada profession doctors. Uh, jadi adakah kita tidak membayar atau me, me, uh, you know, rewarding our uh, doctors enough? Uh, termasuk isu doctor contract uh, yang kita tahu ialah masalah besar sekarang ini um, and uh, I think that's all for now so I just kind of read out the questions so if any of you uh, want to address any of the issues that would be great uh, and in the this round again we just go back to the WHO healthcare health system which is the six building blocks again number one service delivery two health workforce three health information systems for access to essential medicines Five, financing and six, leadership and governance. So, saya jemput lagi sekali um, Heng Leng untuk uh, berkongsi. Uh, jika Heng Leng menjadi Menteri Kesihatan, uh, apa, I, I, just now you already mentioned uh, something about the uh, private, the uh, primary healthcare system. Is there anything else you would want to address, especially with relation to the questions that, uh, you know, some, that has been raised? Thank you, Heng Leng. Uh, thank you. So, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Kumar, I think, uh, posed uh, a challenge in where in the question in the in posing the question where are we going to get the money from? If uh, if you keep on if we keep on saying we need more money, so that that it is true that we need to uh, you know uh, engage at the international level to. Um, to to effect uh, increase uh, uh, more 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 equity in the taxation system, I should say. Uh, but I think between that long term thing or longer term thing and now, I think there are a lot of things that can be done uh, in terms of reviewing. I think there is a lot of. Uh, uh, leakages and a lot of uh, wastages in the government health budget. Uh, 
I think it need to be reviewed, especially uh, spending on defense, uh, and to see where uh, healthcare, uh, where uh, these leakages can be stopped, and or funds can be diverted into health. That's number one. Number two, that we can also we should also review all procurement contracts in the government uh, to review, especially healthcare contracts, to, to look at where leakages are happening, what are the contracts that, that are disadvantaging the public sector, and we try to try, try to ensure competitive bidding. There must be more transparency in, in, in uh, procurement and bidding. And number three, we, we should also think about how to increase taxes. For example, uh, in medical tourism literature, in the development studies, medical tourism literature, me medical tourism is always uh, touted as something that can help developing countries earn foreign exchange and earn money to improve the healthcare. Okay, but that is at the level of rhetoric and, and at, the, at the level of uh, argument. I have never seen, you know, okay, if you say that that is true, then you must do it, right? So how are we able to tax private hospitals that engage or private specialists that engage in uh, medical tourism? That There has to be a tax that channels uh, the resources from one that sector into the government health sector. Okay, and uh, in fact, uh, private medical care have received uh, many tax incentives. After 30 years, I don't think that they can be considered a pioneer industry anymore. And this needs to be reviewed. Okay, so I think it's not all or nothing. It's not like we have to wait until the whole international uh, taxation uh, system changes, but we can, at the moment, work uh, and see how think uh, how money can be uh, sourced from other areas within our own country. Okay, this is the first uh, issue I want to suggest. The second issue is uh, what will I do as uh, as uh, minister minister of health? I think I will work to set up a separate public health services commission. And this pub, uh, separate public health services com commission should be able to function separately in, in, uh, from the PSC, the public services commission. Because at the moment, healthcare staff, everything is, everybody in the medical sector is linked, is, is, is handled by PSC. And PSC uh, cannot, they cannot, you know, they cannot uh, de-link the medical service from the overall civil service in terms of salaries and working conditions. So they cannot respond specifically to the particular problems of health and medical staff in the public health sector. So if we set up a public health services commission, this public health services commission can offer public health services personnel better remuneration, remuneration terms of employment and benefits. And I think that not everybody, I, I, I think that the, the issue of remuneration is not the only issue, okay? Uh, there are other ways. I, I think there are people who want to stay in the government sector, you know, not because of the, the I mean, they don't want to go to private sector because of higher re remuneration there, but because there are very bad uh, working conditions in government sector that they cannot stand it anymore, you know, the overwork uh, and so on and so forth, you know, so you have to set up better terms and conditions, transparent criteria and processes for upskilling, for promotions, for career prospects, and you have to listen to what, what is driving the loss of experienced staff, senior experienced staff, okay? Mm, okay, that's, uh, I won't belabor that point. The third point that I want to talk about is you mentioned insurance. I strongly believe that we should retain the taxation-based financing system that we have. Uh, 
and if we improve our government healthcare system, there will be a lower, uh, a less of a need for people to buy private health insurance. And I think we should also look into how private health insurance needs to be regulated more. Uh, for example, okay, uh, should we allow them to uh, uh, exclude uh, exclude people who have existing health conditions, for example, okay? Um, so all this is important. You have to look at the whole system uh, by uh, not not each section by itself. And I think this is uh, important because if you in if you go in the insurance way, uh, if you go the insurance way, uh, you allow for private health insurance, it will it is uh, going to lead to a very inequitable system. Okay, it, it will lead to a very inequitable system, and uh, in the long run, it will lead to escalation of costs. And there's very limited pooling of risks. Okay. Now, people have also advocated social health insurance. I am not against social health insurance in principle. Okay. But I think that a health uh, insurance system, a health financing system, is not uh, is very important to consider a, a country's history. Okay. His the, how the, the, the development of the healthcare is uh, up to now, if you want to consider uh, a change in the healthcare uh, financing system. And the way that Malaysia has developed, I think that it is not suitable for us to go into social health insurance now. First of all, we are going to introduce more problems, okay? Because we have a very huge informal sector huge informal sector, difficult to collect, difficult to cover, and you're going to have to put in a lot of administrative controls, which will increase your costs in the end. So in the end, and this has actually already been proven by a World Bank study, a World Bank study that studied uh, social health insurance in comparison with taxation-based insurance. And the, this is a study by WEC staff, and uh, overall, social health insurance system is less cost effective. Taxation based system is more cost effective. And there are many other problems that we can talk about, but I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Heng Leng. Really uh, insightful um, ideas there. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, funds, leakages in contracts taxes, increased taxes into public health care. Public Health Services Commission, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, like you said, actually, the doctors don't really, not all doctors want to leave uh, government services. Uh, you know, a lot of doctors actually want to give back, want to work for, you know, the, 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 the crux of the community, but the working conditions just, you know, leave you with no choice. You know, at one point, you have to look after yourself, after your family, and there's, you know, for, for many, there's, there's no other way but private. And, and, and you know, that's a, I, I know that's a difficult decision for many of our doctors. So um, definitely, if we could revamp so that uh, if there are better working conditions and terms uh, for our doctors, then that would be uh, a good uh, kind of uh, option for our, uh, our, you know, to retain the, you know, to avoid the brain drain as well. And then the insurance um, issue uh, where you said, uh, you know, retain tax taxation based on the financing system, but regulation, strict regulation of the private healthcare insurance. So great ideas there. Dr. Murali, okay, apa, apakah uh, uh, cadangan uh, Dr. Murali jika Dr. Murali menjadi Menteri Kesihatan uh, untuk mengatasi masalah sedia ada uh, dan, dan uh, me, membawa sistem kita ke sistem kesihatan kita ke hadapan? Dr. Munirah, thank you. Uh, sebenarnya kebarangkali yang saya nak jadi Menteri Kesihatan adalah uh, idea yang astronomically crazy. So oh, saya pun ni ah, so, so so itulah. So saya pun nak bagi suggestion yang astronomically crazy juga lah. Since dah dibenarkan uh, shoot for the sky. Uh, sebenarnya kalau saya di uh, I mean if you let me dream, uh, saya selalu akan uh, bincang tentang penyatuan sistem. Uh, penyatuan sistem uh, kesihatan awam dan uh, private. 
uh, dan macam mana kita nak buat benda ni actually yang core function is uh, sebenarnya yang kelakarnya saya pal- uh, nanti orang pukul saya pula saya kata one of the uh, things yang paling interesting tentang pandemik ini adalah ia telah menunjukkan kita semua jalan yang kita perlu follow dalam satu stroke Uh, kerajaan telah uh, apa ni uh, buat satu uh, kaedah di mana mereka boleh nationalize any private healthcare institution uh, sama ada benda ni betul atau tidak is is uh, legally morally all this atau lah tapi dulu i just secara praktikal saya bincangkan one in one stroke of ordinance uh, darurat uh, kerajaan telah membolehkan mereka nak seize any healthcare facility nak nationalize any healthcare facility and uh, That actually is uh, dah lama I think banyak daripada kita yang memperjuangkan for example isu-isu seperti doktor boleh bergerak dari private ke public uh, dan vice versa for example kita membenarkan doktor kerajaan mem- mem- membuat lokum uh, di beberapa hari uh, penidak sebagainya including uh, konsultan senior konsultan dan sebagainya tetapi kita tidak memberikan keupayaan untuk uh, private consultants for example nak ambil uh, mengajar uh, to take on master students ke ataupun untuk training of uh, houseman ke kita tak ada sistem untuk membolehkan mereka bergerak dan apa yang mengekangnya adalah sebenarnya uh, very very small bureaucratic uh, apa ni uh, regulations yang uh, seperti yang doktor tengok terus boleh diatasi uh, salah satu big issue yang selalu dibawa-bawa adalah isu indemnity, medical legal dan sebagainya. Again, one stroke of the pen, enactment darurat, I think 6, 8, 10. Kalau you tengok perkara 6, 8, 10, uh, you boleh tengok bahawa dia boleh remove any need for medical legal indemnity langsung, hilang. Perkara yang saya lihat dah bincang lebih kurang 15 tahun, why private sector specialist cannot work in public, uh, one stroke can be removed. So sebenarnya the key is political will. Uh, so and uh, if you notice none of these actions cost a single cent. You know uh, and uh, saya selalu refer, saya pernah uh, berkhidmat di negara Thailand uh, uh, di, di WHO pada masa itu dan one of the interesting things is dia ada very simple requirement beberapa jam, lebih kurang 40 jam kalau tak salah saya, di mana uh, private specialist, uh, consultants have to either take a teaching position or kena see patients in government sector. Uh, simple as that. So kalau 40 jam uh, dalam sebulan tu, I don't think our private senior consultants tu take the time. Uh, we'll, we'll see it as a big issue for example. And one, it will decongest your specialist clinics. Even uh, private GPs to to senior private GPs yang consultant level like for example like macam doktor lah uh, to actually mentor and and clear up Uh, some teaching for our junior MOs dekat uh, family medicine punya setting. These are things that we dream about. That, But it's not difficult to make it happen. Boleh sebenarnya. And the pandemic ini menunjukkan satu uh, example yang clear. Saya, uh, I'm a social health insurance man. Uh, uh, because, simply because di negara-negara seperti Malaysia, kita tak boleh kawal bajet. Sampai hari ini, walaupun kita ada beberapa menteri, uh, Perdana Menteri, pun yang merupakan doktor tetapi simply tak ada orang yang take ownership over the health budget nobody is willing to fight for it always uh, primary industry uh, international trade industry they uh, these kind of things education defense they will always have a greater share of the budget is is memang uh, the pull and push of economics so one of the main reason why saya selalu menyokong social health insurance adalah kerana dia akan lock healthcare money untuk healthcare saja tak boleh orang ambil duit social health insurance dalam pool of social health insurance nak beli kapal selam. Tak boleh. You know? Uh, orang tak boleh ambil duit social health insurance nak build some another tiga uh, empat bangunan yang seratus tingkat. Tak boleh. So the money, the pool from social health insurance always has to remain as a earmark expenditure within the health sector. Itu yang satu. And I think one of the important lessons yang kita belajar juga daripada pandemik ini adalah the importance of protect health. Uh, saya harap Dr. Anas tengok malam-malam ni. Uh, CEO of protect health. No, I'm joking. Um, because uh, we uh, despite kita ada beberapa mechanism kita find out that kita sebenarnya very difficult for public sector funds to be used to pay private expenditure 
kita dah find out from the pandemic. Simple, kita nak suruh dia orang bagi vaccination, Kementerian Kesihatan tak boleh bahaya. The G, private GPs. You finally need one structure, yang one entity dan kebetulannya nasib kita ada PH Corp yang buat this program per B40. So immediately that become the vehicle for us to pay all the private GPs for all the vaccination that they're doing. Again, saya tak komen uh, private GP vaccination cukup ke, private vaccination uh, bayaran dia cukup ke, telah meluas ke. Banyak ada masalah tersendiri tapi I'm talking from the philosophical point of view lah that this entity yang jadi this big uh, pool of of uh, funding dia yang boleh control dan dia regulate and uh, unfortunately as everyone will agree at the table tonight money is king so kalau saya one of the biggest controls of uh, any kind of behavior be daripada anak saya yang 2 tahun dia beli gula-gula baru dia akan pergi tidur something like that lah you have to give some carrot and some stick and unfortunately the biggest carrot the biggest stick is money so kalau kita nak regulate sama ada health insurance sector ke private insurance eh, private medical sector ke government sector ke even government sector kena regulate by money why is it we have overcrowding of uh, government sector for example kerana tidak ada incentive untuk for them to do better you know uh, it's more of the same you are still using macam very broad line budgeting historical budgeting these are things that uh, will will never uh, kind of uh, allow for any kind of creativity or development or administrative measures within the system kalau um, for example kenapa private specialist uh, boleh seorang je dia boleh tengok 30 patient tak payah ada sampai 5 jururawat uh, satu uh, what is this uh, one person to write the notes uh, for example uh, and um, these are things that kita ada abundance in government uh, facilities of resources tapi are we using them correctly? I think we could use them much better. But why the private specialist, for example, learn to do with just half a nurse? Satu nurse share antara tiga specialist. Lain pun boleh buat sendiri. Things like this lean and mean things lah, for example, is things that the government could do with. So, um, my my kind of sliding into my second kind of wish is, ayuh, mari kita corporatekan. Kalau kita nak corporatekan uh, apa ni, uh, private institutions yang kita dah buat sejak tahun 80-an, kita bina private hospital dan sebagainya, mari kita corporatekan every single government clinic dan government hospital. Semua ada line budget daripada Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia or even this health regulatory body ni. And uh, and uh, korang perform, kita bayar. Tak perform, tak bayar. Senang je. Uh, and uh, the moment that you know customer is uh, it has quite kind of input customer malas menunggu uh, dekat this over congested for example government clinics they choose to go to a private gp di mana again the health regulator follow the patient lah bayar as as uh, i think everybody is mentioning we have to come back to this capitation scheme so kalau patient tu move to private doctor they happy there uh, budget untuk government facility yang berdekatan tu patut drop so the moment that does happen immediately you see they will try their best to attract back the patient and of course we are not attracting with candy uh, free gula-gula or something it's by quality of care that's how we we kind of drive uh, attraction back of patients into whichever sector so we need a regulatory uh, body and that regulatory body needs to be able to wield the power wield the the decision making and that needs to come from the ability to control the money kan apa masalahnya of course sama ada and and banyak orang ada legitimate concerns tentang benda ni termasuk diri saya sendiri you make such a powerful entity semua orang nak jadi CEO dia semua orang nak jadi dia punya board of directors semua orang nak jadi chairman dia adalah semua nak control budget eh, this is another issue lah i'm very theoretically i'm talking about it lah so kalau macam tu is social and health insurance is is one of the very interesting pockets yang kita boleh uh, use as a as a instrument to will change sebab until now i think uh, all of uh, all of my distinguished uh, panelists uh, malam ni ada terlibat dalam over decades of macam reform discussions kita ada from Harvard lah, Oxford lah, the first who came, did the research today report, I think diorang pun banyak semua dah pencen. Tapi still nothing has been done. Dekat tiga dekad, we've been trying to reform our health system. Because it comes back to this political will, political kind of drive. Uh, again, we so for example, we come back to things like we were talking about health tourism. Uh, for me, I would just go back to something yang already uh, existing. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is how do we bring money into the health system? I think... 
Dr. J. Kumar told very correctly, we keep on fighting for budget, budget, budget. And budget ni duit bukan nak jatuh dari langit. We have to find some ways for us to bring back money into this public healthcare punya pot. And uh, one of the ways of doing that, again, uh, for example, uh, I go back to something that's already in existence, tourism tax. Uh, have you noticed, kalau you pergi Penang, uh, or pergi Melaka dan sebagainya, which have all these nice cities, adalah seinggit you kena bayar dalam mana-mana hotel tu, or 80 sen, or whatever lah. Uh, there is some, it's called a sort of sum like that. Similarly, for medical tourism, it won't take much, okay, for both, so for services given, services rendered, uh, including your consultation and all that, charge lah one ringgit ke, 80 cent ke, which goes into a special earmarked health fund. So at least by you having so many health tourists, uh, some money is coming back into the local system, for example. That could be an a, a, an easy way of doing it. Um, uh, and, and I mean, it's small uh, amounts which don't create such a kind of big pressure onto uh, the system, but the numbers will actually uh, make up your volume will make up for for that expenditure. Again, if the money goes back into a general pool, hilang lah, guys. Uh, if it goes, so it needs to go back into a special earmarked health kind of fund. That that's where uh, these things uh, kind of are. So it, it's uh, it's it's this is this kind of big reform lah, yang yang saya uh, mimpikan, but. Is it even practical? As, as Dr. pointed out very rightly, even something like Perker B40 so sampai hari ini, it's a, it's a really good idea. Even yesterday, I think I was speaking about how Perker B40 is such a good idea. Uh, tapi tak ada orang nak bagi duit. It's not, it, it's not funded well enough for it to grow beyond this current uh, pocket. Tapi sanggupkah orang to fund it? Eh, big, become a big issue. So that that's the ideal world that we all need to kind of hopefully live in. Thank you. Thank you so much Dr. Muradi. Sangat saya teruja dengan idea-idea yang dikemukakan uh, dalam uh, kita punya chat room di Facebook pun dah ada yang sokong Dr. Muradi jadi uh, Menteri Kesihatan. Uh, jadi kalau uh, kita you know kita idea-idea yang sangat baik. Uh, dan saya kira um, one of the important things uh, or interesting things that you pointed out was this uh, kind of carrot and stick system where where you pay incentives for government uh, services to actually you know work harder gain the kpis and get more money and uh, this is a system that i'm used to just just to share in the gp health system in the uk so each gp even though we are uh, considered under the nhs under the government but you have to work for the money so the, the more the better you achieve the more money you get from the government you get more incentives so you know that that kind of uh, so it makes you work harder it makes you reach your kpis it makes you want to reach targets and and that way you know you, you get better kind of terms as well so uh, definitely great idea that the social health health insurance corporate can the the government clinic uh, government uh, and and uh, government uh, clinics and hospitals so uh, and tourism tax so great ideas there okay uh next uh chihan uh back to you what would you do if you are uh, the Minister of Health, and tonight you can be the Minister of Health on here, on this platform, so feel free, uh, Jihan. Thanks, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, I think uh, if you look back to the uh, WHO framework system, I think the last one you say is leadership and governance. Actually, that, that one is the most important because the political view should come from there, and then you would decide uh, what kind of financing and how you deploy the, the workforce, how you organize the system. I think you have to need to have some kind of leaders who know how to run the system. But of course, I, I will agree with uh, Dr. Chiang Leng. I think the health system in place right now comes from development and involvement. There's a path de dependency. And why uh, US has the most expensive health system? Because there's something that happened in the past that determined why they cannot be up in our system. Yeah, so, uh, so political view is important. I think prior, prioritizing uh, policy is important. Uh, yeah, if you look at a lot of health budget around the world uh, for other governments, other countries, you can see that for even poorer countries, like not a lot poorer, but still poorer, like South Africa, Thailand, they can allocate about 13, 15% of the government budget compared to ours, just 10%. How, how, how come they can do that? I think. That, that goes back to what a society actually expects uh, of the government. Uh, is the health uh, as a kind of a core social services provided by the government to the people? Is it a very important and a very popular uh, demand by the people uh, that have to force the government actually to go back to the drawing board and just relocate 
uh, the, the, the resources and finances accordingly and give some priority to health because uh, we can see that there's a lot of issues in terms of uh, non-communicable diseases and this could uh, uh, reduce our productivity in economies and a lot of um, um, sectors also cut across. So I, I will start with the 4% GDP budget, MOH budget from Pakatan uh, Harapan. I, I, yeah, I, I agree with the idea. It's not because I want to support a party or not, it's, it's irrelevant, but I think it's a good starting point because um, you can see um, how uh, other countries also allocate sufficiently because we, we know that the system is under stress. For example, I also, uh, uh, for um, um, Dr. Chen Leng's idea to set up the, uh, the, our own uh, Public Health Services Commission, but if you want to delay, that means there's some there will be some kind of um, adjustment in the remuneration. Probably will pay better to specialists, to a lot of um, uh, doctors, and can take up the uh, contract doctors faster. Then it can expand our ability to care for um, to to meet the the healthcare demand. So this needs money, and uh, more than half of our emotional budget goes to actually uh, remuneration. So it's a big investment. If you want to uh, beef up our um, primary care system, I will personally propose to set up some kind of family doctor system and the NHS, but we need to be better than NHS. We cannot allow people to wait two weeks to, to see a doctor like that. So we also have to uh, increase the budget uh, in, uh, to, to, to primary care. Because right now, if we see, um, our MOH uh, budget is allocated about half for medical care for the secondary and tertiary. Only half of the half, I mean, just a quarter for the primary care. It's, it's a very imbalanced budget. Uh, uh, the problem is not that the, the, the medical care portion is uh, unnecessary. They're actually already very stressed. These are the pressing need because people are really sick. They need uh, 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 immediate attention already. But I will see that from another perspective of under uh, uh, funding for the, uh, the, the, the public health or primary care. So if you want to have the family doctor system, you want to have a per capita to involve all the private GPs, I actually very support the linkage. That means you need more money. So you all have to go back to the, uh, the planning. I think the MOH uh, planning division have all the figures, uh, trends, if you go back to the evidence-based planning and do the zero-based budgeting based on needs, I think you have a lot of justification to the MOF. I, 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 would, I will say that actually uh, MOH have tried their best in their case to argue for more budget based on evidence, but it it's all goes back to the political view of the government or, or the finance minister, whether they want to give or not. I think, uh, yeah, so, so that's, the, that's the thing. Uh, there's no such thing as a earmark fund, just like Dr. Murari said. Yeah, unless you have some kind of um, corporate like uh, Protect Health Corporation, you can park the money and give grant, use the grant money, so you, you, they, can, they can save your money. So if um, the government wants to have some kind of leeway um, in um, flexibility of uh, uh, funding, I think PHC shows a way. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, in a good way or not, but um, they probably need some kind of um, innovation and flexibility. But of course, uh, people public has to have a good scrutinization of the, the finance of that GLC as well, so that we have can can root out all the um, uh, corruption and all this uh, non transparency dealing. Uh, so um, on, I, I, I would I would say that our public um, system, although it's under stress and have some kind of crack, but it's not broken. I, I won't uh, actually argue uh, to switch the system to a social health insurance. At first, you have to think about how, where else you're going to get the money. Just like uh, Dr. Chen always said, we have a, a lot of our population uh, are self-employed like in the informal sectors. It's very difficult to raise money from there. And the current uh, taxpayers base is all already middle class and those already paying a lot. If you ask them to pay in addition, they also will make noise or they already have their own private insurance or some other things. So they actually don't care. So, so I actually don't want to see the, the, the country have more fragmentation in terms of um, uh, the, the health authorities, different kind of health authorities, the coordination and things like that. This 
is what is happening to the NHS right now because there's a lot of fragmentation. At first, when the pandemic hit uh, UK, their response actually is uh, poorer and slower than us. Even the, uh, the diagnostic test, they have to outsource to Deloitte. So they actually lost the response, the coordination ourselves. But under our current health uh, system, strongly under the leadership of a uh, director general, they can have a meeting and they have, can coordinate everything because it's under the one structure. So I, I think the governance is, uh, is still intact and a lot of uh, response can be faster. Just that I think the resources is the main thing that we are lacking right now. If with that, then we can actually um, strengthen the primary care because that is the, 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 for the future saving. Because we, if we can have a good family doctor system and doctor actually um, see patients regularly, not because the patients are sick, Every time uh, a lot of people just uh, don't have the continuum of care because they don't treat, uh, uh, they don't have the family doctor system. So they, 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 they're just free and easy. Like they don't need to get any medical advice on things. Only when they have problems, they think about doctors and they, they think about all the health policy system and look at uh, uh, the cancer treatment, all this, and find out why is it so expensive? How, why is it they are already in the very late stage, only they go for uh, uh, treatment or this. So a lot of problems uh, exist because uh, we don't have this kind of connection between the community and the primary care. So strengthening the primary care is the way to go if I were the minister, that's totally. So um, lastly, I just want to address uh, about the diversity part because I think uh, Malaysia is good they talk about the uh, universal health uh, coverage, but there are some groups actually are not under the coverage, for example, non-citizens. And we Malaysia, you know, in the globalized world, we have families actually made up of uh, multinationals and they are non-citizens as well, but they ask to pay the foreigners fund and there are other uh, undocumented uh, uh, migrants and even undocumented people living in this country. They, I think this uh, this system doesn't treat them uh, fairly and probably discriminate them. So I I would say that uh, on the diversity part, there has to be a universal uh, universal healthcare to all, non discrimination. I think the government can afford it because uh, we already uh, spend a lot to subsidize the uh, uh, the communities and the country. Actually, it's to protect the health of everyone because we don't want to have um, migrants fall sick and then spread the diseases. So it's wise that government revise and make, make it a point that everyone residing in this country can uh, automatically get uh, the treatment like other uh, citizens. Uh, my sharing is until now, thank you. Thank you very much, Chihan, for this uh, excellent idea. So basically, if Chihan jadi Menteri Kesihatan, uh, kita memang takkan ambil social health insurance. Kan? Memang dia tak setuju. Kalau Dr. Murali, dia nak pegu uh, social health insurance. Nanti kita bincang dalam parlimen, tapi itu bila parlimen buka lah. Eh? <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, next, uh, uh, Prof. Aisyah. Uh, saya jumpa Prof. Aisyah semula untuk uh, kongsikan. Uh, other than what you shared just now, well, what would you do if you had uh, you know, the authority uh, in the health ministry uh, to maybe address some of the issues raised or uh, you know as a response to any of uh, our other panelists uh, okay i think being the minister of health i don't think the minister of health will have a deep in uh, knowledge about health okay because it is a politically appointed uh, position right so i should recognize that there are experts beyond me therefore um, and also make sure that health is not just in the domain of Ministry of Health. Because, you know, obviously, we've talked about taxes, taxation, blah, 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 you know, how much money we can get into the Ministry of Health uh, and for health uh, in the, for the country. We are under the, uh, under the purview of MOF, for example, right? Ministry of Finance. Will they give the money over? Do they recognize that these uh, issues are... Uh, important. So I think um, from what I understand what uh, Heng Leng mentioned about the Public Health Commission, so I can foresee that um, this organization would be multi-sectoral, not just Ministry of Health. And we're talking about health of the country, not the health of Ministry of Health, you know, health of citizens of Malaysia. Hence, it 
uh, requires a bigger political will than just from the Ministry of Health. So I think that would be the first thing. I think uh, if we had the opportunity to uh, make sure that health in the country is not just the problem of Ministry of Health. So that's number one. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not from LSE. Um, I'm a surgeon, okay, but from what I understand from the problems that we face now is really because everything is put on Ministry of Health. Okay, but we have experts in the country, you know. I think uh, we have um, a fantastic, uh, vibrant private sector. We got a vibrant uh, uh, public uh, banking system. I mean, everything is digitized. But why doesn't it happen in Ministry of Health? So I think data driven, um, data driven uh, decision making, I think would be very important. And I think Ministry of Health now is um, suffering from the lack of the data that they can get it quickly, uh, effectively, uh, at, and, and a real time data, you know. So I think digitization of health system is so important. And I think what uh, Dr. Murali was mentioning about the carrot and stick. So without, without data, you won't be able to have a stick or neither a carrot, right? So I think investment in good uh, health informatics, digitization of processes, uh, budgeting, nothing on paper anymore would be very important, I think, for a very modern health system or a Ministry of Health to, to be able to make good decisions. So that's one of the things I think that would be important. The other one is, I think we are always very high in the scores for policy making. So if you look at some of the uh, commission uh, reports for cancer, for example, I think there was a white paper that came out uh, early this year in February. You could see that our scoring was very high. We were like number two. Wait, uh, let me see. Policy and planning. We are number two after Australia for index of cancer preparedness. Okay, so they scored us very high. We're just like after Australia. We are even uh, higher than South Korea, by the way. Okay, but do you really see that the, the, the scorecard, you know, on our practice? I mean, I'm a clinician, I'm on the ground. I can see people coming with great disease, people not able to afford their treatments, you know. So even though we have policy and planning scored very high, but our action plans, our care delivery, how are we doing that, you know? And I think maybe because there's too much control at the federal level and there's not much um, care being uh, thought of or even coming out with solutions at the local level. So I think even like say, uh, Jabatan Kesihatan Negeri Selangor, do they have enough um, capacity or even uh, the mandate to actually do things on their own, to solve local issues? You know, I think a lot of the countries that we, when you go, uh, like in Australia and all that, their, their healthcare is actually managed in a regional manner. Maybe there's even competition among the regions to be the best, you know. So I think you can localize, um, make it more uh, implementable. Um, you have uh, the, you know who the, the players are. Because when you're sitting, let's say in Putrajaya, federally, you may not know what's happening on the ground. It's very difficult for you to actually implement anything. So I would say decentralize some of the mandate to the local governments so that they can also contribute to the healthcare of, of the nation. Okay. Um, okay, other than that, I think uh, what Murali mentioned about political will, I think we really need political will, but we also must keep the politics out. So if you are the Ministry of Health, be it from whatever party, when you join, when you become, especially health education, okay, this, you cannot compromise. There, there should not be any politicking. So if you are digitized well, you're, you're transparent in all the degrees, um, you know, I think that will be your scorecard for the next election, you know. And, and I think we, we, we really want this. Um, and and I, I suppose being a person on the ground, looking at how uh, we cannot achieve many things, because of maybe even issues with uh, policy issues like maybe involvement of regional procurement of drugs. You know, I, I think these are really at that level when you're the Ministry of Minister of Health, um, looking at how you can improve, uh, reduce the cost 
to the public you know i think that's something i think we should uh you know look at so i think in short uh actually i told murali this you know uh secretly lah on whatsapp just now if i was minister of health i might get him to be our dg of health <laughs> okay so i mean i i think we need a lot of heads together and uh and, and malaysia is not short of it you know so i know that i think a lot of times uh in our country when we want to do something or we want to reform our health system what do we do we contact people from abroad to do some study in our country when we actually know what's happening in the country and there are actually many many experts in the country that can actually contribute to this so i really hope i think the future is when we can work together use the best resources the country has and uh, yeah and then i think uh, with good transparent political will we will get there somehow okay thank you munira Thank you so much, Prof Aisha. Well, you know, we have enough quorum here. Menteri Kesihatan, Timbalan 1, 2, 3, DG, uh, boleh dah settle. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you <laughs> for the for the great input there, uh, Prof Aisha. You talked about political, but not politicized. That's absolutely important. That's where we see, you know, issues arise and decentralization among some of the uh, uh, ideas that, that you proposed just now. Uh, before we go on uh, back to Dr. Kumar, I'm actually aware we have 10, you know, kind of 10 minutes to 10.30. We've gone for two hours, great conversations. I'm, I'm just so excited and hopeful that, you know, we have such great minds. And, and this is what believe, we believe in Project Bangsa Malaysia, that sebenarnya kita ada pakar-pakaran yang sangat hebat di, you know, ground level, yang sebenarnya kita boleh uh, membawa kebaikan kepada sistem, sistem uh, pol dasar polisi negara kita secara keseluruhan. Walaupun malam ni kita bincangkan kesihatan tapi right across the board we believe we have the right resources the right manpower the right minds you know with the right heart as well so hopeful for a better malaysia in the future i just wanted to uh, comment i forgot because i was talking about parliament pasal tu lupa uh chihan i wanted to just uh, respond to you that you know it, it's my uh, passion uh, primary healthcare is is you know is is uh, my my uh, forte and i would love for us to have that primary healthcare where you know we can we can uh, see people from the womb to the tomb you know uh, the continuity of care i you know you know me as your family doctor i will treat you you come to me every time i know you inside out i would love to have that kind of system which we, we don't have right now and and also when you mention about macam kita nak provide healthcare untuk semua, uh, semua yang berada di Malaysia dan uh, saya rasa di situ where uh, my work in Kasih Hospice Foundation as a, a charity NGO, we are able to do that and, and I love it about that, that we are able to treat everyone and everyone free at the point of care despite whatever their nationality, race, background, faith and and we I really hope that for, for our country. So uh, definitely like, you know, hopeful uh, dreams there, yeah? Anyway, uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, because you started off in the beginning, just in case you have anything to respond to any of our, you know, Menteri Menteri Kesihatan, Calon Calon Menteri Kesihatan, anything you would like to add on to what, uh, you know, uh, the other panelists have said uh, throughout tonight? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Munir. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, in 1996, I was working in uh, EPOGH, still in government service. And one day I went down to the office and I found a whole stack of uh, contracts where the doc, where they actually were thinking of getting all of us to sign to become part of a corporatized hospital. It went that far, you know. All I think there were the, the, the major GHS were all pulled into this, and they were at the verge of getting us to sign contracts to become officers in a contract hospital, and that's when. I, together with some people in MMA and all that, made a lot of noise about it. And then it went out to the public. It's a big, big, uh, big noise. And then it just stopped, like, you know, it just stopped then. And the reason why, you know, uh, people like myself and others in the People uh, Health Forum are against corporatization is that you, uh, you make it into, you marketize the whole thing. The problem you're facing is too much market is causing problems. You make it even more market. So let's say we have the idea of this corporatized hospital is uh, there's no more global budget. They give services and then they charge the government. So they're talking of DRGs, you know, disease-related uh, groups. See, the thing is, uh, if I was the the medical director of a of a corporatized hospital, you know, um, what I would want to do is I need to earn money. So it would be better if more of my doctors did appendicectomies instead of saying this is only mesenteric lymphadenitis, send the person back. It would be better if more of my doctors did angiograms 
instead of just doing a stress test and saying, no, it doesn't look like heart. Because the more I intervene, the more I can claim from the central fund. You know? Whereas, you know, if I'm very, very correct, um, and I just intervene when I need to, I won't earn so much money. It's always cheaper to intervene on a fairly well person, you know, you go in a white appendix, it's very easy to remove. You do a LSCS, uh, cesarean section on a lady who doesn't require it, it's quite simple. You do a, you do a, a angiogram on a person who doesn't quite require it, it's also quite simple. So, you know, you do, so you tend to move towards over intervention and over treatment because of economic reasons, you know. So it actually impacts on the kind of, can, and then it also impacts on your budget, like, because then you're charging more. So I think, you know, you've got to think it through, you know, when you, when you treat the medical, see doctors now in government service, it's a large capitation scheme. So how much they earn and how much the hospital earns doesn't depend on exactly what they do. If they manage a case by doing LSCS, they don't earn anything more, the hospital doesn't earn anything more. So the decisions are completely based on clinical. But when you put money into it, when the hospital earns by the number of appendix you do, the number of LSCS you do, the number of stents you do, the number of surgeries you do, the number of scopes you do, then all the things that earn money for the hospital will be promoted. So, you know, it, it, gets, it gets in the way of a clinical judgment. And as you, as you know, you know, in the medical profession, there's tremendous information asymmetry. If I tell my patient, hey, you need a scope, they'll probably take it, right? You, you, need, you need to do an angiogram, they'll take it. How can they make a judgment whether they require it or not? And when I report to the central agency again, it's easy to have information because the, the central agency is not there to see what I did. So I don't think, you know, treating human beings uh, as homo economists, you know, that people are only driven by market things, people are only driven by money. Of course, money is important, but that's not the only thing, you know. So I think that's going down the wrong track. It's a neoliberal thinking that man is driven by money, so you use market in everything. That's neoliberal. And I think it's a wrong way to go. It doesn't work that way. The other thing with Malaysia is the issue of governance. If we create, if the health budget doesn't go to hospitals, it goes to this centralized agency that pays the budget, uh, pays all hospitals, um, government and private, based on the kind of services they give. Then what you're going to end up with is you have an agency with a budget of about 60 billion. I mean, now the government health budget is 30 billion, outside of the spending about 30 billion. You're getting 60 billion into a government agency. How well, are we, how well are we handling these things? In Malaysia, the political class, whichever coalition they come from, are so used to getting frontier income from the funds they manage, either the way in which they procure things and all that. So uh, have we got our governance built to the stage that we want to take our whole health budget and give it to an agency, I don't know, we're taking a very big gamble, you know, with our, with our health. So these are the kinds of things we really have to look at, like, you know, before we, and the other thing is when you make the whole health system, uh, you know, they give treatment and they claim, then what happens to uh, preventive health? So there will be all your hospitals, preventive health is just, if you do it, like, you know, because it doesn't make a difference to you. If you do a, a, a below knee amputation or you do actual treatment of complications of diabetes, you make money. If you do education for diabetes, I'm not sure how much money you're going to get. So I mean, the, the, so I think you've got to think it through very carefully. Like. We want to make use a market mechanism to solve our current problems. We may actually end up in a worse situation than we are now. Like. Okay. Now, I think um, it's very important that we keep discussing because obviously, even say, even in this panel, among us, we're not having a, an agreement, you know? So I think it's very important that we uh, look at this whole thing, uh, discuss it further, and our decisions mustn't be based on the fact that we don't have enough money. So we must privatize or we must do a public-private public partnership. The issue of not enough money, that constraint is not a fixed uh, thing, you know? It's a variable which we can address. But what kind of health system do we want? And I think ultimately, uh, the kind of health system we have actually reflects the kind of society we have, the kind of relationship we have among everyone, that, that our commitment to look after our fellow men who are 
unfortunate enough to get cancer or to get SLE or to get a heart problem, they didn't choose it. I mean, you know, they got it. How do we deal with them? So I think it actually touches our humanity, you know. It's how humane our society is, you know. And it uh, builds solid solidarity in society, a system that is based on the NHS model of what the Malaysian public health system actually builds solidarity that we look after everyone else, you know. And I think it's good for building a sense of nation, a sense of a people, uh, a sense of uh, belonging. And I think it cuts down even mental health and all that. I think it's important for us to do that. So I think let's not go for market solutions, like, because they go the other direction. You know, I think we've got to go for capitation. That means the whole the healthcare system in Malaysia is actually a, the healthcare system in the, the public side is a capitation system. States up, you know, hospitals are paid a certain amount of money. You handle that and you handle everything, you know. So I think we should see how can, we can, as, as Jihan said, it's not broken. It's under stress, not because the system itself is wrong, but because money is not enough. So I think we should see how we can improve on it. And I think these are, these are very important issues because it actually builds the character of our nation. It, it defines who we are as a people. And I think it's a very, very, very important thing. Thanks, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful uh, note to end on, actually, that, you know, how we um, navigate our healthcare system is, is defines us as a nation. Um, I, I, we've, we're at 1031. Amazing. I, you know, I could, we could discuss this all day. In fact, it should be like a whole day forum, really, shouldn't it? Uh, a conference even. Um, I, I just want to open uh, the floor last uh, for any final comments from any of our, our panelists. I'd say we could go on forever, but uh, <laughs> uh, any, any last comments from anybody? Um, actually, Dr. Marina, uh, do you mind if, if we just ask the panelists if they had to summarize uh, Bangsa Malaysia in two words or two values at least, uh, what do you think they would? I know, I know it's quite a, like a different um, question compared to like the other technical question, but uh, maybe some ideas or suggestions regarding yeah. That define okay, thanks, Armin. Great idea. Okay, so uh, um, uh, for those of you maybe new to uh, Project Bangsa Malaysia, uh, you know this is what we are doing in, in Project Bangsa Malaysia. We are inviting our great, you know, uh, human resources to come and discuss about policies, and uh, we believe in you know our values together as Bangsa Malaysia. We believe in grassroots impact, and we believe in you know good policy making. So um, with this, uh, as Harmit suggested, maybe each panelist, would you like to uh, share two values that you think should be the values of Bangsa Malaysia? All right, shall we start with, I'm just looking at my screen here, Dr. Murali first. Unity, tolerance. Thank you so much. All right, okay, Heng Leng. Solidarity from Kumar. Uh, and solidarity and solidarity. Solidarity and solidarity, definitely. Right, uh, Prof Aisha. Okay, two values, trust and empathy. Trust and empathy. Okay, Chihan. Yeah, uh, right to health and solidarity. Right to health and solidarity. Thank you so much. Oh, Dr. Kumar, did you did you want to add two values onto that? Okay, uh, just say leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. Excellent. Thank you so much. This this has been uh, amazing. Uh, I, I you know I've learned so much from the discussions here tonight, and I'm sure our audience too. And we hope you know you know sh do share, like, and share this uh, discussion tonight. And it just proves you know just even with the few uh, experts that we have here pada malam ini kita telah membuktikan yang sebenarnya kita ada kepakaran dan uh, uh, idea-idea yang sangat hebat yang boleh membawa me, me, bukan setakat membetulkan uh, membawa penyelesaian pada masalah yang sedia ada tetapi membawa sistem ke kesihatan kita ke hadapan. Uh, dan ini buktinya dan apa yang kita sebenarnya nak bawa sebagai projek bangsa Malaysia yang uh, kami sangat percaya uh, daripada tim uh, projek bangsa Malaysia um, dan uh, kami harapkan ini menjadi satu uh, titik permulaan uh, untuk perbincangan-perbincangan yang lebih lanjut. 
uh, pada masa akan datang. Uh, so thank you so much everyone uh, for your participation tonight. Uh, our esteemed panelists, it's been great having you. Our team from uh, Project Bangsa Malaysia, all our viewers. And, and just to close off uh, for our tonight session, we will have we will have many sessions. So please do uh, like and follow Project Bangsa Malaysia Facebook um, and Project Wawasan Rakyat as well. And uh, we will have more discussions to come. We've already had with Orang Asal, Sabah, Sarawak, with Belia, you know, so, so we, we, we just want to get all these great uh, people on board, grassroots upwards, and, and hopefully this gives hope to us as a nation that, you know, we have the right minds, the right hearts to bring Malaysia forward. And we can uh, ride through this wave together of this pandemic and hopefully come out through the thunderstorm and, and see witness the rainbow together. Um, another thing I just want to end uh, also is that uh, kita sebenarnya telah menubuhkan satu um, hospital emergency fund a few days ago. And you can check it out on Project Bangsa Malaysia Facebook, which I am in charge of myself. And we have a team from Project Bangsa Malaysia. And we are collecting funds and uh, aiding, uh, trying to direct aid, emergency aid to the hospitals that are in need of equipment uh, at this stage during the pandemic. So please do support our cause. Please spread it. Um, help us. And we are connecting with big funders as well um, and uh, trying to patch up the broken links of the links in the system that are, you know, delaying this aid from getting to uh, where it needs to, which is, uh, you know, our frontliners and our rakyat. So uh, please help us to propagate that as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you again, uh, our esteemed panelists. It's been amazing having you tonight. Um, thank you, uh, all our viewers. Um, Project Salam Bangsa Malaysia. Assalamualaikum and good night. Good night. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Okay.